welcome to Placebo, the podcast where each week my sister and I try and teach each other something interesting about healthcare and medicine. I'm Logan Richards, and this is my sister. And I'm Kaylin Richards. And today on Placebo, we are going to talk about exercise and how it affects your brain. Okay. <laughs> you looked so excited for my announcement. I'm on the edge of my seat. <laughs> <laughs> And I think it's pretty uh, common knowledge, let's say, that exercise is good for you yeah. at this point. Mm, I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> well, while you might not like to do it, no one is arguing that it's good for you. Okay, maybe. Oh, uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> Both people. So today, I'd like to start you... Um, I'd like to start you in a virtual reality lab in Urbana-Champaign, Illinois, which is a, a Midwestern state. Yep, it's in the, <laughs> it's in the Middle-ish. Okay, so today I have a great study from this virtual reality lab. Uh -huh. It's called The Role of Childhood Aerobic Fitness in Successful Street Crossing. <laughs> <laughs> as a child or as an older adult? Um, as, a, as a child. Okay. Now, this study uh, starts one place, but it's going to end a different place, so just bear with me. Okay. <laughs> but it is a, an, a hilarious study. Okay. They literally, in the virtual reality lab, which, if you can picture it, is a room. Big empty room. Yeah, it's a big empty room. Someone wears um, virtual reality goggles mm -hmm. or glasses, so it's basically like a... TVs that you put right up on your eyes, basically. Mm -hmm. And the way that those work is is you can look around and you see kind of a video game type of area. But you feel like you're in it because you can walk around. Yeah. Is it like Pokemon so, Go? <laughs> I was I was I was gonna bring up Pokemon uh, Go. I don't really know what the deal is. This is but... actually an issue. It's not like Pokemon Go because okay. Pokemon Go is augmented reality. This is virtual reality. Okay. So meaning meaning everything you see is part of the virtual space, and they put you on this room with a treadmill. Uh -huh. That I'm not sure exactly what it's called, but the treadmill is not always going like a treadmill in the gym. It reacts to the way that you walk. So if you start to jog, it kind of jogs along with you. Okay. And that makes it so that you can so, walk around in this virtual environment. It's like a hamster wheel. The hamster can run real fast and the wheel will spin around <laughs> or it can so. just kind yeah. of go slowly and it will go slow. And so the study was, keep in mind, this is NIH funded, which I think is just hilarious. There's hope for anyone to get their research funded. <laughs> the study was, the original purpose was to see if aerobic fitness had anything to do with crossing the street safely as a child because apparently um, they need to run fast to get across pedestrian accidents is the second leading cause of death for children oh. which is kind of sad but i did not that know that seems to me more like their ball rolls into the street and they run out to get it not like they were i guess that's crossing that the could street. be I don't know. but you know this study you brought up pokemon go and this study <laughs> was um a few years before it it's from that is now. That is happening. It's, it's right? from 2011. Okay. But this is uh, they were predicting the future. Perhaps they they in this study they looked at the role of of multiple um, distracting type of devices. Phones. And so yeah, they had one other thing where you were looking at your phone. Yeah. But I guess we should get to to get the, to the study. <laughs> there were two groups. Um, there was a group of what they called uh, high fitness children and a group of low fitness children. How, how old are the kids? Do you know? Uh, I do. They were they were from eight to ten years old. Okay. All right. And so they had um, they had a group of high fit children and a group of low fit children. <laughs> No one wants to be in the low fit children group. <laughs> well, some are. And Aww. what they did is they put them. It would have been me. <laughs> no, I don't think you're a low fitness. <laughs> it's not very athletic. She's a low fitness motivated. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm not athletic. <laughs> well, they weren't testing athleticism. Well, okay. sort of. Okay, so what they did, they put them in this fitness, this virtual um, environment, and the virtual environment was a street. That you had to get across. Okay. And I can cross streets. Yeah. That is in my skill set. Well, interestingly, what they found was that was that the children of low fitness did not do as well crossing the street. They didn't and make since it? it was a virtual environment, they it sounds like to me that although they hadn't said it as explicitly, they did say that not none of the participants participants made it successfully across in all the 
situations that they they posed. Did they for get them. hit by cars? So I think they did because oh. there's one picture of a like uh, the treadmill room with the car yeah. driving across. Yeah. But obviously, so they're not really getting hit by cars. They're getting hit by a virtual car. But still, the uh, trauma would be. <laughs> well, they the might not even know trauma. because it's probably like the computer sensors that determine if the car actually hit or not. Anyways, hmm. not all the participants made it across successfully every oh. time. But the high fitness ones did make it across a much larger percentage of the time than the low fitness ones. Mm-hmm. But it's not for the reason you think. They're not like dodging the traffic. No, more. it's not for that. <laughs> it's not because they're better, they're more athletic and dodging cars jumping and jumping across. over them and yeah. sprinting faster. The times to cross the street on all the successful crossings were actually pretty similar between the two groups. Uh-huh. But what was different was the decision making uh-huh. and when to go, when to wait, and various other. Um, the other main aspect of the study, of course, was distraction. So, how well you could deal with the other task that the researchers posed on you to do while also crossing the street. So, it looked mm-hmm. like the two main tasks were doing something on your phone and listening to music. And these in- kids are out. These eight-year-old kids are out. <laughs> Checking their texts and... This is an NIH-funded study at a major yeah. university. Okay. What department was this in? Like a... Oh, uh, we'll go back up. A this was a department of psychology. Okay. So I guess that, that puts a bias on it there. Yeah. But, it, but it's an interesting conclusion that they came to. Mm-hmm. And they cited the... There's a lot of evidence that I think we'll talk about later that says the more aerobic fitness you have, the better academic performance you have there's been a lot of research mm-hmm. in children that that states that okay but what they found here and what they concluded with the study which i think is so interesting because at first you think well yeah the the fitter kids are going to make it across because they're more fit yeah but actually they found that the fitter fit kids make it across because the kids of higher fitness seem to have a better capability for making decisions and especially a better capability for making successful decisions under the stress of multitasking, let's yeah. say. Which is interesting because... <laughs> the modern world is full of multitasking. Well, I, I find this study to be incredibly relevant now with, <laughs> with the Pokemon Go craze. Did that just... I just heard of it. Okay, Did so... It just start? I feel like we shouldn't even add to the media frenzy of Pokemon Go. But I don't think we're considered media. We're definitely we're nothing because there's <laughs> there's twenty of you that listen. No, there's um, more than that. Yeah, so I think it's incredibly relevant because of Pokemon Go, and so Pokemon Go is is augmented reality, meaning that the you play the video game on your phone, but in order to move your character throughout the video game map. You physically have to walk your your body to places in the real world, which correspond to places on the map. <laughs> which might involve crossing the street. Which might involve crossing the street, multitasking while you're um, while you're playing your game, and it's actually really relevant to the study. So they found, you know, the reason that this study was done yes. was because of all these children getting injured from supposedly being distracted by their cell phones Do or walking onto the like, road. Do eight have like smartphones? Is that common now? I don't. I don't know. Neither of us have raised children in this age, so I don't know. I didn't have a phone until I was like... I imagine that... I'm like a flip phone when I, I was like I imagine that children get phones younger and younger now. I guess. I want to go back and read, <laughs> read one sentence. Uh, <laughs> okay. It says, We suggest that crossing a street while concurrently conversing on a cell phone is still undesirable. <laughs> As a single error can have severe consequences. So yeah. even though they found the uh, higher fit children to get across the street faster in all conditions. Yeah. Um, not faster, sorry. More, uh, successfully, more successfully. They still suggest that you should probably pay attention while have, passing the street. Have you ever, like, I've noticed when, sometimes when I've been, like, talking to my phone and, like, really engaged in a conversation while I'm walking. And then I'll all of a sudden realize, like, I've walked, like, two blocks, and I don't even remember the last, like, crossing two streets. Like, I don't remember. So I'm assuming I got across fine, but I don't remember what happened. <laughs> I think you are relying on your, um, your, I don't know, you're relying <laughs> on your brain there to get you through situations you've already Autopilot. Been I mean, mostly that's been, like, downtown, and there's lots of other people, so I'm probably walking with a crowd. But I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it could just like, look be back. Did I cause you an were accident? Paying attention while you were doing it, but but you didn't remember because you were focusing on something else at the yeah. time, so your brain didn't think it was important. 
Interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. What I think we take away from this and Mm -hmm. what the study does is that they say um, on the higher fit group, there is greater activity of the striatum and the hippocampus, which are two brain regions that are involved in uh, memory and decision making. I remember the hippocampus is for memory. I don't don't remember the striatum. The striatum is part of the the basal ganglia. (laughs) Ooh, yeah, okay. The basal ganglia is... I don't think everyone knows its exact functions, but it has a lot to do with coordination, kind of linking together different brain regions. Okay. Um, I specifically remember that professor lecturing about the basic language and saying, what does it do? No one knows. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And I'm not sure anyone still does. Okay. (laughs) Um, But those are two areas of the brain that seem to have something to do with memory as well as decision making. Okay. And so this is kind of where we're going with this is how is having a higher aerobic fitness Mm -hmm. result in, is it more brain function? Is it bigger brain areas? Is it just better performance in measures of brain function? Right. There's a lot of stuff that we need to think about, but it does seem like the research points us in that direction. So there was a recent article in NPR about Mm. this, which kind of, which, although I've kind of thought about exercise and brain function for a while now. Are you saying um, you just copied from NPR? No. (laughs) So the, 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 the NPR article was specifically highlighting this one study and the study is called running induced systemic Cathepsin B secretion is associated with memory function. It's a catchy headline. What's interesting about this, though, is that this study showed that a protein that is made in your muscles... Is that the cathepsin? Yeah, I think so. A protein that's made in your muscles then moves through the, through the blood, passes the blood-brain barrier, mm-hmm. and goes into your hippocampus. Mm-hmm. So this is one of the first clear, direct links between muscle activity mm-hmm. and brain function, mm-hmm. which is really interesting because there's been, we've been able to see those results for a long time, you know, studying the various effects of exercise on different disorders, especially like, um, you know, diseases of the neurological diseases. Mm-hmm. We've been able to see that there's brain change for a long time, but this is the first time that we've been able to see that there's an actual protein that travels from the working muscles into the brain tissue and changes mm-hmm. the brain tissue. So, yeah, so what, what happens with this is that with aerobic exercise, the protein is secreted into the brain, goes into the hippocampus, and that uh, induces neurogenesis in the hippocampus. So, like, it creates more brain cells in the hippocampus, which is your area that focuses on memory. So Interesting. So it is actually building up the brain to be more yeah. robust. And I'm not sure, and I, yeah, I'm not sure they, they really know all the details yet, which is not surprising because that's how these studies always end. I wonder, yeah, I wonder why maybe they didn't speculate on this. Why would that sort of thing even develop why do you think that would be a thing that develops you mean like evolutionarily like why is it important for our brains to be better the more we exercise yes uh that's interesting i think if i were to speculate especially the memory memory related ones well it's it's clear that that our ancestors uh moved around a lot more than our current uh our current humans do and well, they didn't sit at a desk so all day. So my speculation would be that the more you move, the more places you need to remember. Mm-hmm. And so perhaps the more you run, the better your memory needs to be so that you can remember all the details about the world you've been through so that you can stay alive by remembering those <laughs> things. Maybe. Like remembering where the food is or remembering where the dangerous areas are so you stay away from them. Or So if you've not been moving, you don't need to be... You don't need to be aware of all the other things happening around you. You must be safe in your current environment. You don't need to be pushing yourself to think more. <laughs> I don't know. Of course, we have no idea. This is I like speculating, though. Speculationing. Yeah, speculationing. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting. And um, yeah, I'd, I'd say that we certainly don't know why it is the way that it is. Uh-huh. But it does seem that in almost every way, exercise has some type of beneficial effect on the brain. We've been talking mostly about aerobic exercise. And so what that means 
practically is like running, even walking, swimming, things that you do for a long period of time Mm -hmm. that you wouldn't, uh, that you can do repetitively. Not like a sprint? A sprint is, yeah, is not what we would, the classic cardio. So it's not really Mm -hmm. aerobic exercise. And the reason for that is because different energy systems are used in your body to power those motions. Right. So the faster you run, the harder it is and the less long you can run at that speed. The slower you run also too, the more you change towards an anaero- or a, an aerobic. So the people that are running system. and just barely running, that's the best? Well, actually, like, I'm not, like I'm not my sure running if there, speed? I'm not sure if there's research on that, but slow running is technically more aer- aerobically powered than faster running. So when I run at a very slow speed, it's the best for my brain. It might be. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> You're not going to say yes or no there. But the slower you run, the more aerobic, the more percentage of your movement is powered by aerobic, but, the aerobic energy but, system. Yes. So we talked about aerobic exercise. What's the other choice then? Or does, are you going to uh, talk about? Well, practically your other choice anaerobic? Is, is anaerobic. And, and that... Um, is an example of that like the sprinting? Yes, but also, it's interesting because or holding yeah, your breath, we're, we're kind of with your breath hold. It there's a, I think there's a discrepancy between how studies looking at brain function and exercise word their studies mm-hmm. and how studies looking at maybe like nutrition and exercise or like I wonder if it's energy systems and exercise. From, I wonder if they're coming from different perspectives. Like this brain function, like the one you were just talking about, was from a psychology yeah. department. I wonder if they're coming from a psych psychology where they're using more of a loosely a loose yeah. term aerobic meaning just like cardio versus people talking about versus an exercise scientist yeah who's or like using aerobic as a very specific or, yeah. yeah a very specific energy system yeah and you're right and i don't know <laughs> <laughs> um yeah the but that's interesting. Another interesting point, because if you think about people jogging, you know, like depending on your speed, there's it's a mix of energy systems mm-hmm. and you really don't know how like the the <laughs> crossing the street study was measuring highly fit versus uh, low fit and, you know, how those kids were training their fitness. <laughs> right. That's... I mean, how kids shouldn't be doing high intensity training anyways. Right. So. so it's weird. Yeah. Okay, so I think something that we have to talk about is how how does all how how have every all these researchers come to the conclusions that exercise is good for your brain? Okay. The short answer is most of the time when someone is telling you about a chemical, molecular, structural type change in the brain, mm-hmm. Those results are coming from mice. Oh, like a lot of the studies that we've talked about, like my yeah. gut microbes. So if I tell you that that the hippocampus gets larger after aerobic exercise, That's that result probably came from a study that had to do with mice. Did they dissected a mouse? Yes. Aww. Lots of them, probably. Oh. Um, I think it's possible to get those same type of results with uh, MRI. Yeah. Um, but most of the time... MRI those... on the mouse or on per- people? On people. Okay. But most of the time, um, especially when it's... When it's structural, molecular, like if they're saying there's more um, white matter connections, a lot of times that's from a study done with mice. And the interesting thing about that is that the way mice exercise is they run on a wheel, like Like nonstop, right? (laughs) Like a hamster wheel? Yeah. Yeah. So the thing you always have to keep in your mind with the mice studies is that the mice exercise way more than people. Like, mm-hmm. literally in terms of, like, minutes exercised. Are they... Is this because mouse like to run? Or they're just, like, making them run somehow? How do you make a mouse run? I don't run? know the specifics. Perhaps if it's... I don't know. <laughs> it's a good question. Neither of us are researchers, and it's probably an environment that probably neither of us will be in. Not the so. mouse environment. Yeah. The point I'm trying to make, though, is that mice exercise is, in general the same but there are there are some differences between mice exercise and human exercise <laughs> the other thing that the you mice have aren't to, playing tennis <laughs> <laughs> yeah well the types of exercise certainly differ <laughs> and the mice what's weird is like the mice exercise more minutes probably like 
in these studies because they're just okay. running on their wheel mm -hmm. than most people normally would. Mm -hmm. But the weird thing is like, how do you transfer? Is the is like is a mouse doing thirty minutes of exercise the same thing as a human doing thirty minutes of exercise? So they're moving a much smaller distance. Right. Their muscles like, are using this in such a different way because they're yeah. on all fours and probably in up. terms of like atp use which both humans and mouse use which the is mouse what, probably uses way less right which is what a muscle cell uses right atp yeah well not everyone knows what atp is probably i think we've talked about that okay atp stands <laughs> for adenosine triphosphate and it's like i've i've heard the analogy of it like um being like the money that the the cell uses in order to create power. So the more ATP you have, the more energy you can create. So basically, being a human is much less efficient because we're probably standing so it upright. would seem it would seem like thirty minutes of human exercise versus mouse exercise is probably different. Yeah, um, I'm not sure if there's research to support that or not. Uh, I agree with your <laughs> hunch. <laughs> yeah, well, that's actually pointed out in a lot of the papers, is that it's hard to compare mouse exercise versus human exercise. So why do they study in mice? Well, they study mice because it's um, it's easy, I guess. Yeah, but is the information helpful? I think so. I think the reason they do it is probably because it's cheap. You can have a large number of study participants uh, without having to worry about things like um, institutional review boards worrying about ethics and things like that. I worry about ethics more than mice. <laughs> People still worry about ethics, but but less as much. And the way that these yeah. things usually go. So, for instance, the study that I brought up earlier about the protein that travels from the muscles to the brain mm -hmm. that was first done in mice, and they mm -hmm. used that to hypothesize about trying to find a substance that went from the muscle to the brain. Once they found it in mice, they then moved to primates. Mm -hmm. So they used rhesus monkeys and then moved to humans. And this one was interesting was because of the way that this protein works, you can measure it with a blood draw. Mm -hmm. And so they were able to measure the levels of this protein That's in the blood. Easy to measure then. Right. The next point that I have about these exercise and brain studies, which which again, I don't want to. I don't want to talk them down and say they're not true, <laughs> but mm -hmm. the research is still out on a lot of them. So, several that we've mentioned today are done in psychology departments, and mm -hmm. so there's one particular that I'll talk about here in a bit. But it's done with older adults. Mm -hmm. the, like, are they are they hoping that they could say prevent yourself from getting dementia? Exercise. No, um, no. So here's the only reason that, the, that I'm bringing this up is again to mention that the way that we quantify and measure exercise in a lot of these studies that say like exercise benefits the brain mm -hmm. is not always great mm -hmm. and it's not standardized. So an example of like really poor data that we know of is retrospective survey data. So if you ask like, let's say, an older person, how much they exercised for the last 30 years. So, like, like, when you were 40, how much did you exercise regularly? Yeah, well, yeah, pretty <laughs> much. Is This study was a survey of how much they thought they had exercised. And right? I don't know. So how much can you trust that data? Well, if I think, okay, uh, 10 years ago, if you said, Kaylin, huh, 10 years ago when you were 20, how much did you exercise on a regular basis? I don't know. You don't know. And see, that's the thing is like... I think I did a yoga class. What? There's there's just too many variables. It's like, what do I, you know, classify as exercise? Is it when I'm playing sports? Is it when I've decided to go for a run? Like, do I have to be thinking about exercise or can like walking to the grocery store count? Mm -hmm. So... I did walk a lot more. I didn't have a car then. Right? See, there's... And so you don't really... There's no way to accurately report unless you were actually tracking... Yeah. how much exercise you got and what type of exercise you got. So all these studies that use retrospective survey data are kind of questionable in my mm -hmm. book. That being said, let's talk about a result using, oh, no. <laughs> using one of those. <laughs> so there was a study uh, done by someone named Larson called Exercise is Associated with Reduced Risk for Incident dementia among persons 65 years of age what and is, older. What is incident dementia? You mean incidence of dementia? Mm, nope. 
No. Yes, that is the name of the study. I don't <laughs> know why. Um, so this study, it was posted, it was published in the Scandinavian Journal of Medicine and Science and Sports. They got a lot of people, which is, I, th- I think, impressive for a survey, at least. Mm-hmm. Who knows how many people they sent it out to. <laughs> they had 1,740 people older than uh, 65. That's a lot. They probably sent it out to, like, 50,000. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> Who knows? I mean, you, I, you, I figure you can't get a very high response rate. Yeah, like so, a 20% response rate seems pretty good. And again, this study is, I don't know, it's questionable because of the method that they collected the data. First of all, it was people older than 65 reflecting on how much they'd exercised in the past. Okay. And it's survey data, so you get kind of the responder bias of the people that responded is probably not, maybe not an exact sample. Right. I do like how many people it is. And that's probably why it got published is, is that the number of people. of people in the study is pretty high. They did find interesting results. So they found that people who exercise more than three days a week mm-hmm. were less likely to have dementia than those who exercise three or less days a week. But they didn't specify at all what that could be. And so one person could think that I walk to the store three times a week and that is exercise. I guess. Now, I I didn't read the actual... I didn't have access to the actual survey that they oh, okay. sent to people. So it's possible that they asked them questions about their habits that weren't Specific. like, how did you exercise? But they were like, in the past, how many times did you walk to the grocery store? Blah, blah, blah. So they might have asked questions where they were able to then calculate some type of amount of exercise. Mm-hmm. Which it seems reasonable. Mm-hmm. Anyways, I th- the result is still interesting that people who exercise more um, as you age, you have a, a reduced risk for dementia. Did they mean that as you were, if you had, inter- if you had exercised more when you were young, you had a reduced risk, or if you continued to exercise as you grew older? So when I first read this, uh, it, it looked like they were reflecting on how they had exercised in the past. So maybe not having to do with their current habits at all? But they also did say they did. there was a mean follow-up of 6.2 years, meaning that 6.2 years after the survey, they did a follow-up to see the dementia rates. Okay. So... It doesn't look like they took into account the amount of exercise they did in those 6.2 years on but, average after. But just rather they... The survey was given to them when they turned 65. Okay. I think what's what's important about that is that it looks like there's there's something, at least correlational, about exercise and reducing, reducing your risk for memory loss as you age. Uh-huh. And we don't know if that's because the type of people that exercise more are less likely to lose them, you know, less likely at risk for dementia or it's if it's because of exercise. It's a correlation, but not a causation. Yeah. So that's interesting. And that just leads to the fact that a lot more research needs to be done in order to find that question, which is not surprising. I think they could just say it's good for you to exercise. You you might you might have better brain function, <laughs> I but in general you'll be healthier. I don't think that anyone is arguing <laughs> if it's better to exercise or not. Okay, so let's switch from uh, older adults to mm-hmm. adolescents. Mm-hmm. So there was a study called um, Physical Activity Across the Curriculum, the PAAC study, a randomized <laughs> controlled trial to promote physical activity and diminish overweight and obesity in the elementary school children. Okay. So they studied the academic achievement of uh, the kids that they picked for their study, which were in Kansas, I think. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. But they ended up finding that the kids who did the extra exercise were better at memory and had better academic test scores. And so they ended up, the ones who had more exercise did had better brain function, essentially. They did better in school. So, although I guess I would say all of these studies are uh, maybe difficult to quantify, as we talked about before, exact information, they're all finding the same thing. Right. I don't know. It's, it seems to me like it's obvious that exercise is good for the brain, but when you actually go and look at all, all the studies, mm-hmm. the evidence all leads that way, but it's none of it's super strong. No. So, do you think... I mean, well, I wonder how much it is people think it. It just really seems like it should be the case that exercise should should make you think better. But 
the exercise the the um dial like you said is not very strong so is that really is well, it is it a is it a case of um what am i trying to say Bi- bias like the investigator bias they they think confirmation that confirmation bias confirmation bias they think that that might be what they're going to find other studies keep finding the same thing I don't know. You hope that's not going to be the case, but... It's hard to say that. And I think one reason that that's probably not true is that we are finding things more like the the study that found the protein moving from the muscles to the brain. Mm-hmm. So it's likely that there are a lot of connections like that that we haven't discovered yet that mm-hmm. are probably leading to those things. Mm-hmm. And that seems to be the case with a lot of stuff where... We might not understand the mechanism completely the way that it is, but that doesn't mean that the exercise isn't affecting the brain. And so that's where I think a lot of the outcomes that that we've seen are solid. Mm -hmm. And so that's like all all the studies that are showing memory tests, like where someone is prescribed a certain amount of exercise and then asked to remember something, like some type of, you know, remember this random shape. Mm-hmm. And then they have to remember it and reproduce it later. The people who are exercised have done better with that. So before you take a test or before you study, should you go <laughs> for a run? <laughs> well, and then you'll do better on it. Theoretically, right? the 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 people who um, in this protein study, which is I think probably where the the research towards exercise in the brain are going, mm-hmm. they did something like that where they exercised and then had to reproduce this random geometric shape. That so was the outcome they were using. Memory, memory. basically, yeah. Yeah. So I wonder you... how long it lasts, but I think I think it might not be a bad strategy. So if you study, study to say that. if you study, study for your test and then run on your way to school or something <laughs> and then take your test, you might do better. That, than, yeah, I think that's Than not... if you'd like studied to the last minute and then driven there. <laughs> Probably because, well, I mean, study habits are a whole nother topic. But well. <laughs> but we have heard that um, in school that that aerobic exercise increases the amount of blood flow that you're getting to your brain, which mm-hmm. improves performance of pretty much all aspects of it because of the amount of um, like getting more nutrition and oxygen to the brain. So I think you're onto something. It would be good. <laughs> Um, so that's it. That's your lesson from this week's episode. Okay, yeah. <laughs> well, let's get to our real takeaways oh, or okay, our easy sorry. takeaways. So I guess <laughs> just show up to all your tests really sweaty. Just in case you needed another reason to exercise, <laughs> you should um, run to all areas where you need to do a test. <laughs> <laughs> basically, <laughs> basically, the evidence is showing that exercise is leading to increased memory and probably in um, more successful decision making. Although that's kind mm-hmm. of hard to measure. Um, so if you have a hard decision to make, run there as well. Well, maybe, yeah, maybe <laughs> go for maybe go for a run and think about it. <laughs> um, it. It's been shown to work in both children and older adults, so all the way through the lifespan. Mm-hmm. It seems like uh, the more exercise you do, the more helpful it will be later in life. Just run a marathon on your way to your test. Oh, no, it's later in life. <laughs> yeah, no. You want regular exercise, <laughs> not too much. Um but that it also works kind of um, in more short term so that you can take someone who hasn't been exercising for a while and improve memory uh, just with like a exercise program of a few months. And perhaps the most important, mm-hmm. exercise will keep you safe while playing Pokemon Go because you'll, be, <laughs> <laughs> you'll be able to make better decisions about crossing the street because you will have exercised more. And um, we all know, based on the first study, <laughs> that those who are more fit make better decisions crossing the street <laughs> while multitasking. All right. Okay, well, that is confusing. Um, I think... As you can see, the evidence is all over the place, and I probably <laughs> there's probably lots more that I missed. And so if you're interested in more on exercise and how it affects the brain, I'm going to put a bunch of links to the studies I looked at, as well as some interesting videos for oh, anyone who wants videos. to... Uh, yeah, they have like a, a TED Ed one, which is like a little five minute thing, but that uh, yeah. might spark your interest in one area or another. So, where could people go and find those links? Or well, I'm going to put those all on our page at placebopodcast.com for this episode. 
We could also put them on our Facebook page. We could, but there'll be a link on our Facebook to that. Oh, website. just go there. So just go there. That's a little, it's fine. Yeah. Well, we also have the Facebook, as you said, in case you want to contact <laughs> Placebo us. Placebo Podcast. You could like us. That would be nice. Yeah. And if you like the show, even this episode, which I hope will be less confusing than <laughs> us recording it. No. Uh, <laughs> if you like the show, you can go to iTunes and give us a rating. It helps the show. And if, A positive rating. <laughs> even not Thank a positive you. rating. No. Um, or share with a friend or two. All right. Uh, thank you to James Aiken for our music. We'd like to say we're almost at a thousand downloads. It's very exciting for us. Which we have we were not expecting at all, and we'd like to say thank you to the like eighty of you that have downloaded us a bunch of times. No, I don't think that's it. Um, thank you to our listeners. We appreciate it. And we'll see you next week. Goodbye. Bye. theme song <laughs> I can't even think of what our theme song sounds like like that <laughs>